I don't claim to be real good, but I'm real good at loving martial arts. I love it as much as everywhere and ever, and I still train pretty consistently. Hey there, everyone, and thanks for listening to episode 29 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Kyoshi Dave Kovar. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the world's best sparring gear, as well as awesome apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you returning. Don't forget our great products, like our exclusive nutrition bars, great fuel before you train or just as a snack. You can find more information about Whistle Bar and the rest of our products over at whistlekick.com. And all of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more can be found over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We put some good stuff in there, and we promise not to spam you or sell your address to anyone. And now to today's episode. On episode 29, we're joined by Kyoshi Dave Kovar, an incredible martial artist and the founder of Kovar Systems. Kyoshi Kovar has made a name for himself not just as an exceptional martial artist, and he is, but also as an educator. Kyoshi Kovar is passionate about martial arts and helping others reach their martial arts goals, whether it's as a student or as a school owner. He drops a lot of knowledge in this episode, so be ready to catch it. And with that, Kyoshi Kovar, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, happy to be here. Well, I'm happy to have you here. Let's let's jump in. Let's get going with this. Um, you know, I'm sure most of the people listening know at least a little bit about you. Uh, you're all over the web and, and teaching seminars and doing all that. But how'd you get into this? How'd you get started with the martial arts? Um, you know, I, I started officially uh, wrestling in 1971, but in the mid in the mid 60s, I would have been five or six years old. I saw a silhouette of a guy doing a flying sidekick, and and I didn't even know if it was on a billboard or if it was on martial arts school. But I remember it vividly in my head, and I didn't know what it was, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. It was kind of like it found me. I didn't really find it, and then um, I started wrestling when I was in seventh grade, and. And uh, and I always wanted to do karate, and finally, uh, my folks got me started in September of '73 with that. I had to kind of give up. I did I couldn't do both, so uh, I had to. I actually did both wrestling and, and karate for a while, but I ended up having to go with 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 karate, and of course, happy to do it. And and uh, I, I've never looked back. It's kind of like uh, I don't claim to be real good, but I'm real good at loving martial arts. I love it as much as everywhere and ever, and I still train pretty consistently. So. Um, it, it, it never, uh, the thought of, of quitting never occurred, never occurred to me. I see, I, I identify to my students, but, but for me, it was like, um, it's just, just kind of part of who I am, I guess. Wow. So even as, cause you said you started in seventh grade. So even through those, those adolescent, those teen years, you, you never thought about dropping out. Never. So, you know, it was like, uh, it was my place. Uh, it was, it was kind of my crowd. I, I, I take the. Um, my freshman year of high school, I started taking the bus over to right after school. So the bus, you know, whatever time three thirty gets out, and I'd there was a drop off right by our my school. So I would get dropped off by my martial arts school, and my folks would pick me up at nine, and that pretty much was my life through high school. And and then I fell into a school right out of high six months out of high school. I kind of fell into a location, and that was November of nineteen seventy eight, and I've been doing this professionally ever since. So you started teaching six months after graduating high school. Yeah, yeah. It was actually kind of an interesting story is that my instructor is a gentleman named Hanchi Bruce Jetnik, and he's who I started with. And uh, uh, he, he, you know, I was actually, uh, at the, at, this is a long time ago, and there was a, um, some people might have heard of Tracy's Karate Studios. They were a pretty big chain in the 60s and 70s. And and uh, um, that was my school, the school that I started at. It had just gone independent, but it was kind of a Tracy's Karate School mentality, and which is based on, uh, you know, it had a lot of good stuff for their time. And it was based on the private lesson system. So every student got one private lesson a week. It was actually based on Arthur Murray's dance studios. It's where they mm. got the methodology. And uh, so what happened was, is, but I don't know how many students there was, but let's just say there's a 120 members in the school because it was a pretty packed, and, pretty packed place. Uh, that means 120 half-hour private lessons a week. That's a lot of private. So what happened was is that once you became, you know, once you've been trained for six, seven months, you started teaching. And so for me, that was by 14, I was teaching classes. But it was interesting as there's, well, privates, I should say, there was very few uh, uh, kids training. So I was teaching adults, which I had no business doing, right, at a real young age and, and, and started teaching classes at about 16. And, 
And uh, uh, and it wasn't because I was the, the the best instructor. It was like sometimes I was the only guy that would show up that day, so we had no choice <laughs> to do. But you know, so I did everything wrong. But in the process, I kind of it kind of spurred my interest in wanting to do this for a living. So, uh, like I said, I fell into an opportunity. And originally, my folks bought into it because uh, it was going to be a way to get through college, right? And at the time, and this is 1978, there's very few people. I mean, there were people doing it, but very few people who were having any real financial success doing martial arts. There was a few, but most of them, you know, it wasn't really the industry like it is now. And, and so it was kind of like, okay, through college, you can do this and you'll get a real job. And, and, uh, and it, it took a, a really long time. I, I struggled, uh, you know, until it was really the mid to late eighties, you know, the karate kid came out and I don't know, 84, 85 and something happened. It was like a light switch went on. All of a sudden the kids just started coming in in droves into the school. And fortunately I always enjoyed working with the, with the youth anyway. And so it was, it, right. so I already kind of had a little bit of a jump on, on like the other schools. And, and, uh, and so we just kind of started to really, I brought my brother on in, in um, what October of 1987? It's the same year, the month I got married, and 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 my brother had a real strong business background, so we just really that's when we started just blowing up and and uh, growing and and still trying to you know trying to maintain that balance now. Yeah, that's cool. So, you know, of course, one of the things that you're known for is your consulting around martial arts businesses and everything. So, um, I'm going to guess there's somebody out there kind of yelling at the podcast they they want to know were you, were you successful initially oh heck no heck no i okay. mean success is fleeting i mean what's what I, i'm still got you still got to work hard to maintain success right but I, I probably still do tons wrong i i still don't have all the answers but i'm a lot better than i was you know 10 years ago and certainly 20 and 30 years ago and and uh it's it's kind of like there's a reason a reason why a lot of guys this is a hard time to be in the martial arts industry. If there's martial arts professionals listening, it's a, it's a different time, I should say, than it was in let's say the 80s and 90s, and and, and that it's 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 still a great time to be in the martial arts industry. But it's hard. It, it, there's a lot more competition, not just martial arts schools, but a lot more activities for people, and you've really got to stand out. And, and it used to be that man in the 80s and 90s, you could be a mediocre instructor and be a mediocre businessman, and you could do okay in this business. But anymore, that's just not the case. It's like kind of like you know, you have to have your A game. You know what I'm saying? It's like you, you, yeah. uh, you, you got to bring. You, you just got to really know what you're doing and be willing to you know, work hard. And if you do that, it's a great time to run school still. Sure. Cool. So I'm sure you got a ton of stories. You've been training, teaching for the majority of your life, certainly. Why don't you think about your best martial arts story and give us that one? Oh man, best martial arts story. So, all right. So I'm, I'm about 19 or 20 years old. This would have been you know, 1980. Uh, um, I'm remembering this is the ninja craze. Stephen Hayes just popped out into the into the equation, and everybody, every ninja too, is it right? In the 70s, it was, you know, of course, uh, Bruce Lee and, and Kung Fu with a TV series, etc. And and so I would I would work out. I did all these crazy like. Uh, middle of the night training sessions we'd meet at a certain place at two in the morning and and do more sports training and, and we'd climb fences. We 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 played. So what we would do one time in particular, I was gonna meet with a bunch of my my, my martial arts friends and we were gonna meet at midnight at the at the square in this college campus. And we we, we the deal was is you had to sneak into it. We sort some fences you had to do and, and you know we would train and, and, and spar and, and whatnot and then we'd run back, right? And, and it, it sounds pretty like I said, bizarre, but this was the eighties and I was a kid. So forgive me, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> so in the process, I, I'm, uh, uh, I've got, I've got camouflage fatigues on and I've got like, I don't know how many knives on me. Right. And I was just kind of the rite of passage at the time. And, you know, a, 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 a expandable baton, you know, you know, the whole drill, right. I probably even had like a ninja mask on. I'm not saying yeah. hardly. And, just, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm trying, I see a security card, car, the lights of the security card kind of rounding the corner and realizing I got to run faster to, to, to make the lights. So I'm not paying attention to where I'm going. And I, I turned to look straight ahead right as I hit a, 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 a pole uh, for connecting the chain of fence, and I knocked myself out. And uh, fortunately, the, the, uh, the security card didn't, didn't see me. So they, they drive on by, and, and, and I wake up, and I don't, I don't think I was out for more than a few seconds. I'm not really sure. But, I, you know, I, I, have, I cut my head wide open, and my, my nose is bleeding from 
both nostrils. So I realized, man, this is before cell phones, so I'm not going to call my friends. But I've got a couple more fences to climb. That's off. i got to go to ER to get this fixed. So I hop in my car, and I and I think I'm all sweaty, and I drive to ER, and and, uh, and I'm not really thinking anything of it until I get to the reflection in the mirror at the ER, and I see I'm in, the, I'm in camouflage fatigues. And I'm covered with blood. And so, this is had never been uh, uh, never been helped so fast in the ER before. So, uh, I ended up getting a bunch of stitches. But that was, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know that it's a martial arts story, but that's kind of a training story that stands out in my mind. Another one, kind of along the same lines, I'm doing this early morning workout, and and uh, I think I we're running through a park and by this river, and and what now is we call what people call parkour or free running. We called it light body, and we used to do it back in the day. Not near to the level that people do it now, of course, but but we would do that. And one of the things there was this one uh, a tree branch that that overhung over this this uh, this hill. And what what you would do is you'd reach out and you'd grab on this tree branch and you'd swing your legs really far and let go. And you and you'd sail for ten, twelve, fourteen feet before you landed and you'd shoulder roll out of it, right? And so mm-hmm. I've got a bunch of guys behind me. I'm determined to look really good. So. I swing my legs out really hard, extra far, and I pull that branch, and the branch cracks halfway through. And I'm falling down this hill, landing on my head from about eight feet up, and uh, and uh, and it ended up, uh, you know, once. And then one of my students comes sliding out, checking me, hits me. Long story short, they take me to the and the. Uh, they call an ambulance and they take me. By the way, I, I had a shirt that my 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 friend of mine and I. We had these shirts made up that say on the back, "I kick ass," right. Uh, and then I had a sweatshirt over the top of that. And so anyway, I'm, oh, I get to the ER and they take some x-rays and they realize that they can move me a little bit that I didn't break. I, and so they take off, the doctor takes off my sweatshirt and I'm whining like a baby. I mean, he, he sits and takes it off. And then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm complaining. He goes, looks at me and he goes, good, I totally forgot I had this shirt. He goes, he goes so you kick ass, huh? <laughs> it was probably the most humbling, humiliating moment of my whole life. Of course, I never wore that shirt ever again. But, uh, so... The, those are two great stories and, and really vivid. And, and uh, I had to mute my microphone because of my laughter at a couple of points in there. So thank you. Thank you for sharing those. So let's shift gears a little bit. How how do you think that the martial arts has made you a better person? So, you know, it's really it, – it's, it's not an easy answer because I've been doing it all my life. I don't really remember not doing martial arts, right? Uh, I think one of the things that martial arts brings to the occasion is the, you know, the equation that it gives you a certain amount of confidence that allows you to stay calm under pressure, right? So let's just imagine, for example, that, that I rear end you, you know, uh, in traffic and you're maybe in a very aggressive, maybe you have predatorial instincts in you. And you get out of the car and I get out of the car and you come up and you're mad as heck. And let's say I know no martial arts, I have no martial arts training at all, I'm not very sure of myself. So chances are I'm going to respond in one of two ways. One way I'm going to respond is I'm going to respond out of fear. And I'm going to kind of, I'm sorry about that, sir. And I'm going to kind of cower a bit. And if you have predatorial instincts, then you're going to love that. You're going to be all over me, right? Another way I might respond is I might not know how to stay calm. So I might let my emotion get control of me and and be right back in your face, right? And of course, we know that's that's like adding fuel to the fire, right? I mean, it's just going to make it worse. So I think... One of the things that martial arts has done for me is that it's allowed me to stay calm under pressure because if that same situation comes up and you come up and approach me in an aggressive fashion, I can calmly talk my way out of it because um, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I'm not thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do if I have to fight? I'm thinking, okay, I can defend myself if I have to. I don't want to. I want to get out of this peacefully, but, you know, but, but I have that as an option. And therefore, I present myself in a much more calm, matter-of-fact way, and I'm more likely to present a, a, what a peaceful solution, so to speak. And that's one thing. Another is just the whole aspect. The main two qualities, martial arts is really founded on respect, right? And when you really instill that, you know, the main two qualities I see in martial arts is self-discipline and respect. And, and those are that those are qualities, of course, are, are critically valuable outside the martial arts world as well. And, and, and so I think that's been helpful in learning me and teaching me how to, uh, you know, be respectful to other people. And, and, and self-discipline allows you to kind of get stuff done, I guess. How do you bring respect into your children's programs at your schools? 
Well, I think it's what we start people out, right? The very first thing we do is we teach them the attention stance and, 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 and a bow. We explain what that means. We talk about the importance of a polite greeting. It's, it's kind of the under, one of the underlying tones of everything that we do. And it, it starts by you can't tell people you've got to show people, right? So it starts by the instructors to be respectful of the students and parents. Right. And then it's a matter of kind of educating them on the reasons why, like one of the things that we'll tell, you know, children is, hey, man, it's not enough to have respect. It's important to show respect. And how you show respect, these are things you do. You say, you know, you say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, uh, you know how to do it. You look so in the eye when you do a polite greeting. We do a lot of role playing with that. Right. And, and so that's. Uh, and then, of course, anytime they're interacting with a partner, just the whole nature of like bound your partner, you can't help. That can't help but affect your level of empathy and respect towards your partner when you do it. So it's never a matter of demanding it. It's, it's you earn it through your actions and through education. So you've certainly had a lot of high points in your life. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing great things. You're getting to meet a lot of people. You're, you're traveling all over, getting to teach and, and learn from others. And that's, that's gotta be fantastic. I know it'd be fantastic for me. So maybe I'm projecting, but let's, let's swing the other end of the spectrum. Tell us about something that maybe wasn't so great in your life and how your martial arts training and experience allowed you to move past it. Yeah, well, you know, um, there's, at every stage, there's a great quote, I believe it's originally attributed to Plato, and it goes like this, be kind with him you meet for there fighting a hard battle. And what that means is, man, we all have challenges, and they're ongoing. You know what I'm saying? Like at any given time, you know, someone might have a financial challenge, a relationship challenge, a health challenge, who knows? When you get done with this one, you're going to have others, right? So it's like, uh, and so you know, I've had my share, and you know, your pain is your pain. Someone else might have it worse, but when you still, your pain is still your pain, right? And, and so I've had several things like, uh, you know, that have uh, given me what, what, uh, plenty of reasons to lose sleep. And I probably the one that jumps out at me the most is uh, we, uh, uh, several years back, attempted a national expansion. We, we got a, we were getting infused with a bunch of uh, venture capital money, and we were going to do a national chain of martial arts schools. And at the time, my brother and I had four locations. And, and after being approached from a gentleman, a very well-intended good guy, that that, that said, hey, we can, let's, let's see if we can get a whole bunch of schools going, we, we uh, started growing and went from four to 20 schools in about a year and a half. And these are corporate-owned. These aren't franchised. And, uh uh-huh. And yeah, things were going pretty good. We did, we did, had a lot of investor money and loans, and and but all of a sudden, uh, the next round of financing was supposed to come through, didn't come through, and we found ourselves being massive amounts of money every month, spending a lot more in these locations than they than they were bringing in, and and it, and it cost you know it, it was it was pretty painful. I mean, we're still to a certain degree you know dealing with the after effects of that, uh, and there there was a point where you know little things like you've got. A Monday morning staff meeting that starts at nine o'clock. It's eight thirty. You just got a call from your 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 bookkeeper. You're saying, "Hey, man, there's no money in the account. You got to where you need twenty thousand dollars to make payroll by three p.m. tonight. What are you going to do?" And having to fee- and then having to walk out to the staff meeting and saying to everybody, "Hey, guys, this is going to be a great week," and we're gonna, knowing that you have no idea how you're going to do this, right? And I and so and we fought like that for in in you know probably two thousand seven, eight, nine. We're just really challenging times. But there's one time where we were being told by some really mentors of ours and some smart guys saying, you ought to file for P, you ought to declare bankruptcy, you know, and cut your losses. You can still keep your business, but it'll be different. But, you know, that's what you ought to do because there's no way you can keep yourself out of this hole. And my partner, my business partner and I, uh, my brother had since retired, and, and my new business partner, a gentleman named Dave Chamberlain, who was doing a great job, and he, he and I looked at each other, and neither of us wanted to do that. And and, uh, and I, I had to stop the conversation to go down to the floor and do some training because martial arts training is always the thing that's kept me sane through challenges. And, and I've been doing jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu since 94, and, and I'm still pretty active in it. And, and uh, so that was especially the grappling in this, in this time frame was really my release, my escape. And so I'm training with one of my students, and, and, uh, and he's uh, uh, I, anytime you're working with someone that maybe has less skill than you do to make it interesting, you might put yourself in a bad position and kind of fight out of it, right? Hmm. So I let him take my back, and I let him start to sink in a choke, and I'm going to fight my way out of it. And all of a sudden, I realized, holy crap, this guy's gotten better. This choke is really tight. Whoa, man. And there was a third guy that was watching us, so I knew if I passed out, he was going to stop the match, right? That's always a danger when it's just two guys training, right? But uh, And so I remember thinking, I started, and anyway, this grapple is it felt the feeling when you're really fatigued and you've got somebody's body weight on you and, and you're having a hard time breathing. And, and it, it kind of a mild panic kicks in. And I remember thinking, holy crap. 
oh man, and I, I, and I remember thinking, I, should, I could tap, and I remember I should tap, and I remember thinking, well, you know what, I could tap, but I don't have to, not yet. And so I calmly took a breath and I adjusted my my collar a little bit. Next thing you know, it took a few, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, but I managed to make, fight my way out of it. Well, what was interesting, when I got done with that match, I thought, that's where my business is. I could tap out, but I don't have to, not yet. And uh, my business partner and I kind of looked you in the eye and said, you know, we're going to fight through this, we're going to figure it out, and we did just that. And and so that was, there was a few years, that was the lowest part, and martial arts really kept me sane through that. And, you know, it's like a, there there's, it's kind of cliche, but there's always a way when you know there's a way. And, you know, when you, when people are having hard times, I, I can't say how many times that I've been in a low spot. I remember what Teddy Roosevelt said, and he says, when you get the end of the rope, tie a knot in it and hang on. And sometimes that's what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? Most people fail because they give up. They just stop. And and sometimes, man, you just got to keep, you just got to keep getting up and getting up. And, even, and the trick is, even when you don't feel like it. As a matter of fact, especially when you don't feel like it. And if you can do that, usually you can work things through things. Now, how about for somebody that maybe struggles with holding on to the end of the rope? I mean, that's something that I think a lot of us that have spent time in the martial arts, you know, we've we've kind of learned that. I mean, sometimes it's trial by fire. Sometimes it's because we're sick of doing push-ups or whatever other punishment might be thrown at us or we're sick of getting choked out but if someone wanted to train that that resiliency have any tips for them yeah you know it's, it's kind of like you start small i call it one of the things is voluntary deprivation uh, and what it means is, is that you you, you to, to control your ego means that you're in charge right if somebody does not have self-discipline that's what it really goes back to then they're at the whims of their emotions right and their ego and and uh, oh, i don't feel like doing it so they don't do it right like really who, uh, I get up every morning real early and I'm at the gym first thing, right? So I'm usually at the gym by 5.15 or 5.20 in the morning and that's because that's the time it's worse for me, right? Uh, and and do I like getting up? Do I like the alarm that goes off at, a, at 10 to 5? Heck no, I don't like it at all. And every morning, every friggin' morning, I come up with a, a, a bunch of excuses as to why I shouldn't go. Oh, I didn't sleep good last night. I got a hangnail. My back hurts. And all that stuff that pops in your head. And, and every friggin' morning, almost every morning, not always, every now and then, you, get, you know, I just get up anyway. And I'm always glad I did. And and so what I do is I try to anchor in. So at the end, when I'm hopping in my car to drive home, or if my morning workout is a run around the park by my house, when I finish, I try to take a moment, take a breath, and remind myself how I was feeling an hour ago that I didn't want to do this, and how glad I did it. Right. So really, I think the key to develop self-discipline, or you know, or to get mental toughness, is that first off, mental toughness and physical pain are directly related. Okay. So your ability to like hold a half push-up for a minute and just free and do your best, right? That develops mental toughness. I mean, you're putting yourself on the line, right? But the, the trick is, is is that most people, when they, when they want to get to the next level, they they make things too difficult by having their goals too extravagant. So, for example, let's just say I haven't worked out in a year, years, and I decide to get in better shape, so I make a commitment that I'm going to get up an hour early and I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to work out really hard. Well, what's going to happen? 99 out of 100 times, it's going to last a week and then it's going to be too much. I'm going to fall back into my old habits. Right. However, if instead I think, man, I need to start working out, I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up five minutes early and I'm going to do 10 squats and 10 push ups and walk around the block once. And I'm going to commit to doing that for a week. Now, that is a realistic goal. So I do that a week. I'm successful. I'm able to put a check off on my success box, so to speak. And the next week I add to that a little bit. And guess what? Six months from now, I'm up an hour early training. Right. So that's, I think, the key is to start small and set yourself up for success. At the end of the day, you want that that uh, that uh, endorphin rush that you get from accomplishment. Mm. Great, great I suggestion. I hope. Dopamine is, is the, the chemical that's released when you're successful. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Um, great practical. I mean, we don't get into a lot of practical, um, so so to speak, hands-on things on this show. But uh, there's a great one for people that are, are you know struggling with anything to move forward to find a way baby steps I mean that's really another that's way to right. put it and just one of my and, and, movies Bill and Murray baby steps right I mean, what yeah. About yeah absolutely yeah just to honor that you know those those small goals just yep. because they're not the big goal doesn't mean that they shouldn't be honored and, and you shouldn't take some joy from that yes sir so I'd like you to think about 
all the people that you've had a chance to train with. And other than those initial instructors, and, and you mentioned a couple of them, who's had the biggest influence on you and your martial arts career? On martial arts teachers? Uh, um, no, it didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily have to be be a teacher, but you know, you know I just like to take out those. Yeah, so I think uh, outside of my initial instructors, I spent a lot of time for several years with Grandmaster Jun Lee, and I have the utmost respect uh, for him as a kind of a legitimate guy that really upholds what a guy, in my mind, a, you know, a martial arts master should aspire to. He's, you know, he's a dedicated, lifelong martial artist. It's a a, you know, an amazing athlete, really, and amazing high level of self discipline. A super honorable guy, so I learned a ton from him. As far as not necessarily, I mean, I I, I learned his art, and that was fine, but that wasn't really the gist of it. It was really his example. I have one story by Grandmaster Jim Lee. This is would have been 1992. He was honored by George Bush Senior, President George Bush Senior, for a point of light for outstanding Asian America, and he was given an award in L.A. And Grandmaster Jim Lee called him to say. Bring some kids and you know, like the demonstration for the president. And it took me like a quarter second to say, I'll be there, right? Because I knew that. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I met, met him and, and, and I saw he went down there. And of course, it was an amazing event. And I got to meet the president for the picture, saying, Well, it was very cool. But, but kind of the highlight of the story is I was at the time, very much you know, doing a thousand push ups a day. And, and I he did stayed at my house several times. And I, you know, I knew he was really doing it, right? But um, that morning uh, of the, of the, of the, the uh, demonstration. I was a room with him. We were sharing a room. And, and uh, that morning, we did our workout. We did 500 push-ups. Or I should say, he did 500 push-ups. I attempted to do 500 push-ups. Right? <laughs> and then we went about our day. And, and then and then at the, at the presidential dinner afterwards, he'd met up with some of his Korean friends and, that he hadn't seen for years. And I went back to our room. And along about 11, 30, quarter 12, Grandmaster Reed comes into our room and he quietly, and I, I just, because uh, he likes to talk and I was tired. I didn't want to let him know I was away. So I acted like I was asleep. And he quietly took off his uh, his dress top and went bent down, and I watched him do five sets of 100 push-ups before he did that. And no one was watching. He didn't know I was watching. But that's what he does. You know, he does 1,000 push-ups a day, and damn it, he's going to do it. And so that was really made an amazing impression on me. So he, you know, that that was uh, something that just kind of really stuck uh, other guys that would be, there's so many, and I'm going to leave people off the list, but, but uh, uh, Hernia Reyes Sr. has been a, a, an amazing mentor to me, uh, and uh, I just have the utmost uh, respect for him and the role model he's been. And, and uh, another guy is not really thinking of as a martial arts, and, and everybody's, a lot of people attribute success to him, but uh, a guy that really helped me, uh, not directly, although I, I did go to a lot of the seminars, was uh, um, and that is Tony Robbins. I was extremely involved with him for probably seven, eight years. I actually, actually on, on, I was on his black belt testing panel, held, helped tell boards for him when he wrote them. And, but uh, oh, but cool. he was, he really helped me to kind of shape kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of how we look at our curriculum and, and, and how I can really make sure that it's cutting edge and helped me to really feel like it's okay to change things. You know, in, in other words, uh, uh, up until then, I, I kind of, thought there was, I should never be allowed to do anything different than the way I was taught because what's my right? What do I know? Uh, but uh, so it kind of helped me look at the way I teach our curriculum and, and the material that we do and, and, and improve upon it. And there was so at the time when I started doing some modifications, I had a lot of people look at me like, what are you doing? You, you know, you're, uh, how dare you, so to speak? And those are the very same guys have now come back and said, hey, show me how to do that. It looks pretty cool. You know, your students look good. So, uh, <laughs> and a lot of that came from, from, you know, participating in, in Tony Robbins things. Well, um, you've never been to a martial arts event that we've been at as Whistle Kick, but we run a push-up contest. So um, the fans out there that are, you know, are familiar with that, I'm sure are going to beat me if I don't ask. How were June Reese push-ups? Oh, not really good. <laughs> no. <laughs> but a thousand a day. By the way, uh, if Grandmaster Junior was here, he would tell you, you know, I think he, his wife would get after him. They were half to three quarter push ups. But let me okay. tell you, you could do a lot of them. And, and, and <laughs> I recently did, I did 37 push ups, uh, pull ups, excuse me, in one set on my on my 55th birthday about a year and a half ago. And I uh, I thought, I, to this day, I would tell people, I can do a lot of pull ups, and I can. But then I watched the video because I actually posted it on YouTube, on Facebook. 
And I never knew that I was only doing like half pull-ups. It was like, oh, it was the most humiliating thing I ever saw. I thought my, I swear I thought my arms were locking out, but not even close. So I had, after that, I had a little more empathy for the Grandmaster Junior Reed's 1,000 push-ups a day. Uh, I'd say a 1,000 of, of anything. I mean, standing up and sitting down from a chair a 1,000 times yes. is, you know, is, is going to be taxing for sure. Yep. Cool. How about competition? Was that ever ever your thing? Sure, I competed. My first tournament was uh, you know, excuse me, February of 1974. My last one was uh, in 1989. So about 15 years, I competed a lot. Super heavy in the late 80s and early 90s. I was a, a probably pretty good regional competitor. You know, I was a rated in Karate Illustrated back in the day. Uh, uh, but honestly, there were a lot of guys better than me. But I did certainly did enjoy the competition. What did you like about it? I think it was the training, you know, it gave you a reason to train. And, and at that age, like, I don't really feel as much like I need a reason to train or I just enjoy training. Um, but, but back then it was like, it wasn't the tournament that made you better. It was all the extra training you got to prepare for the tournament that made you better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was, uh, I had a bunch of guys locally that we would, we would get together frequently uh, to, to, to spar, right? And, 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 uh, and that's, uh, so all the camaraderie that went along with the whole competition. I'm not really that into competition anymore. I respect it and I've got students that are, uh, you know, but I've spent so many, so many Saturdays in a hot sway gymnasium, you know, saying to it doesn't, yeah. I don't need to do that a lot anymore. I probably maybe get to one event a year, you know, maybe two that I'll maybe do or watch. Uh, but for me, it was a very important part of my training. I don't think it's right for everyone, but uh, certain people, it's absolutely the right thing for. Yeah. Were, were you a fighter? Were you a forms I, guy? I was. I, I did both, but uh, fighting okay. was really probably, uh, um, you know, what I uh, uh, you know, it probably excelled at more. And I fought a lot of the guys of my day. You know, I fought Alvin Crowder and Steve Nasty Anderson and, and Chip Wright, some of the guys from Tommy Gilbert, some of the guys from uh, California greats from back in the day, Johnny Gyro. Uh, those were all my contemporaries. And uh, um, would be a few, lost to a lot of them. But, but you know, we got in the ring with them, so that was important. Yeah, yeah, good times. So if there's, if you could train with anybody that you haven't, and, and we'll even open it up and say, even if they've passed on. Oh, that's easy, Bruce Lee. Okay. The the number one answer to that question for sure. But give us your reasons. Well, because he was so far ahead of his time. You know, he really was like, you know, he was a Renaissance man, not only a martial artist, but an inventor, and you know, an artist, a, a poet, you know, a really... Uh, uh, you know, so good at so many things, and and uh, uh, you just to feel his passion would have been really cool. You know, and I, I, I like to think of you know what would he be doing now if he was training, and, and what he'd be working on. But so that's that's absolutely would be my first, second, and third choice. Cool. And, yeah, a great and, man. And so besides that, probably I've never I've met him, but uh, my lineage in jujitsu is under uh, Hicks and Gracie. I've never I've never actually trained with him, and and uh, mm-hmm. uh, my lineage is uh, under. Carlos Valente and Pedro Sauer, which are both black belts in, in, in under Hickson. But if I was to have a chance to, like, if I was able to spend a week with somebody that I haven't trained with, that would probably be the top of my list. Mm. What would you hope to get from training with him? You know what? I would go with an empty cup and find out. I'm sure, okay. that, you know, with no expectations. You, you know what I mean? Okay. No assumptions, I should say. That's, that's as, as martial arts of an answer as as one could expect. <laughs> so um, we actually had one of our, our show fans write in this question for you, and I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, but he's wondering, how do you personally, as an instructor, handle a student that maybe is struggling to, to wrap their brain around a particular technique? Somebody just, you know, it's just not sinking in yeah. with the typical teaching methods. What do you do? Well, first off, is it, is, is it, uh, there's a quote I learned from Grandmaster Ree, as a matter of fact, and it goes like this. When you're having challenges with a child or a student, never end in correction with a smile until habit is performed correctly. What that basically means is patience, patience, patience. And uh, as long as they're, they're showing interest in trying to learn it, you being impatient or, uh, or short never helps the process. And, and I, I have to remind myself because often I think, come on, man, what's up with you? Why can't you get this, right? But, but mm-hmm. often when I'm impatient, it really isn't about them. It's because I'm preoccupied with something else. In other words, I'm working with you and you put your own leg back and I snap at you, right? Well, the reason I snap at you is because five minutes ago I was on the phone and I found out that my 
my the auto repair is going to be a lot more than I thought. It was going to be, I thought it was going to be 50 bucks and it's going to be 500 bucks. So I'm still thinking about that when I'm teaching you. And you put your wrong leg back and I snap at you, right? And so the point is, is that my experience as an instructor, if we go out there and we bow on the mat, we step on the floor and we think, okay, man, my goal today, I want to have a positive impact. I want everybody to leave thinking I'm glad I came. And I want everybody to leave coming back one more time. You know, that's all I'm going to focus on. And if I do that, I will find, you'll find yourself being way more patient. And that's really all it is with that. And then you, obviously, the technical stuff, you, know, you figure out different modalities. Maybe you're, maybe you're explaining it. Maybe they need to see it. Maybe, maybe they see it, but they need to understand it more through feeling it, right? All right. And so, uh, you know, people usually learn through different modalities, whether it be kinesthetic, which is feeling, you know, auditory or visual. And you know, good instructors try to cover all three of those bases, but sometimes one person, like, I, I find if I've got a kid that's, or somebody's having a challenge, sometimes I'll actually pat on their left arm when I say, okay, step back with this side, right? And I'll pat on their right when they say you punch with that, right? So they can come, mm. and sometimes that's the trick, right? Uh, sometimes it's follow the leader, you know, them doing, uh, uh, you know, I stand side by side with them and then have them follow through the movements. But, but once again, it's really just like being as patient as possible. And that doesn't mean you're not hard on people. You know what I'm saying? And you can, you know, crack the whip as hard as you want, but you got to come from a position of love and respect, not punishment, you know, and anger. Well, I, I, Dan, I hope you're listening and I hope that that gives you some food for thought. So I'm going to guess with your passion for the arts that you're also a fan of martial arts movies. Sure. Okay. You got a favorite? Of course. End of the Dragon. Okay. Now, because Bruce Lee was in it or for well, other reasons? Well, I think yes. And just because it's like the best martial arts movie ever made hands down, you know, I, I obviously <laughs> The thing about modern martial arts, there's so many you know, stellar martial artists. And you know, another one that people don't even probably know about, it was Jackie Chan, one of Jackie Chan's first attempts in the United States called The Big Brawl. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, I've seen it. It's like a friggin' great movie, right? A great, yeah. amazing movie. Yeah. But, but back to uh, like what I like about End of the Dragon and that I don't like as much about a lot of movies now is that the, the fight scenes from a distance, you know it was real. Now they can make anybody look good because they hack and it's in your face. You know what I'm saying? They don't really yep. see the full you know, the full view, which I, which I appreciate. So, uh, yeah, but that would be, like I said, the big brawl would be way up there. Uh, um, above the law is a great one. I didn't really, I, you know, uh, I have of course a lot of respect for Steven Seagal, although I did the rest of his movies. I didn't really care for that much, but uh, above the law, I, I thought was, uh, you know, like, like an excellent, uh, yeah. uh, uh, excellent movie as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and your, your point about that, Legitimate martial arts choreography versus edited and, and CGI exactly. stuff is is well taken, and I think that's a, a big delineation. I'd say that's kind of the the line for me personally when I look at a movie: is it a martial arts movie or not? Yep. You know, if 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 they're as you said, hacking footage together to make a fight scene, that's not martial arts. You don't get to do that in the street. Yeah. And. How about favorite martial arts actor? Uh, you know what? <laughs> Are we going Bruce Lee again? Yeah, yeah, but Jackie Chan would be up there. I really like Jet Li. Jet Li has this okay. certain confidence. There's a scene with Jet Li where, where uh, you know, in the, the hero, where he's walking in and he's yeah. walking into this temple to be punished, and there's thousands of monks on either side of him, and you see him from the back, walking from the back, but his posture is so friggin' good. And he's exuding, you know, confidence like you would not believe. It was just, it's just real powerful. The way he commands, he's just a little guy, but boy, he really commands the screen. So I've always enjoyed, you know, his work. And just from a sheer entertainment value, you know, Jackie Chan is, is, is amazing. And, and, and because I, I've met him a few times and I have a great deal of respect for him, you got to throw Chuck Norris in there. He's done some great stuff as well. Sure. Yeah, all all three are great. And uh, Jet Li is one of my personal favorites. And I, I think one of the reasons I love his movies is that you can see his skill come through. Yep, totally. It doesn't matter what he's doing. It is very clear. He knows what he's doing. Absolutely. And, and I really, I, I have a lot of respect for that. How about books? Any martial arts books you'd recommend to people? So, you know, it, it sounds very cliche, right? But, but uh, the art of war by Sun Tzu is an amazing read. And I probably read it 30 times. 
and, oh. and, and the Book of Five Rings, I've read a bunch, but I, I, it's too smart for me. I don't quite I get it, but I don't quite, uh, you know, I, I want to say, boy, that was so profound for me, but it wasn't necessarily. I mean, I, 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 I didn't maybe get as much out of it as I could, although I did under, I used the concept of, you know, earth, wind, fire, water, void as, uh, uh, you know, kind of a way of looking at your training. And I did this in value, but, but uh, the art of war has such some really such practical and functional application. Uh, um, uh, and then there's a book that I read from my Yido, one of my black books, from my Mike Hessen Yido. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jack up the name Hakuge. I forget how exactly to pronounce it, but it was written in the, in the, in the 17th century by a samurai. And it's got the, uh, and I'm, like I said, I, I'm messing the title up bad, but it's, it's got a great uh, look at at, uh, um, and, and how a samurai actually looked and, and thought. And by the way, a lot of what they say is it was very, you know, like by today's standards, very racist and opinionated. But if you get past that, there were some real gems. And one of the gems was that samurais are in the book talking about is that you are 24 seven, you know, everything you do, you're in the moment, you know, you're, you're mm-hmm. ready at all times. And he wasn't just talking about being ready for battle as much as you are you know, very Zen, right? Like, you know, present focused, right? You're alert and aware of everything that's going on behind you I and mean, around you. And, and, and the, the, the idea is not to be, be one, it be at one place with your body and another place with your mind. Cause then you're nowhere that, you know, wherever you are physically, you also have to be mentally and emotionally. And, and that's a, you know, a powerful thing that we all need to be reminded of on a regular basis. I mean, how often have I been home at dinner and my daughter's telling me about her day and I'm hardly paying attention because I'm thinking about some issue at the school. Right? And I got to learn to like be in that moment. And that's the a couple of the takeaways from that book. Great, great points. And of course, I'll figure out that book and, and maybe you and I can coordinate and make sure that it's the right book and we'll have that in the show notes over at the website at uh, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for anybody that wants to check that out. Cool. So what's keeping you going right now? You got any goals, anything you're you're looking to accomplish over the uh, next few years? You know, I uh, always got lots of goals. So yeah, you know, we're, uh, um, uh, I don't plan on slowing down anytime soon. You know, we've got uh, I've, I've got, um, like we're all busy. I mean, you're busy, and anybody listening is also busy. busy. I, I am as well. I've got a lot of projects. I kind of split my time amongst uh, kind of overseeing our, our schools in Sacramento, um, and I've got some on the East Coast that I, that I that, that I'm kind of helping out with, and and uh, and then I've got Cobar Systems where we help out a lot of other martial arts schools throughout the actually the world now. We've got uh, people that have our products and. Uh, in Australia and Spain and Germany and the UK and Canada and, and so that's that's cool uh, that we're able to do that and that's a lot of my time is focused on trying to I want I want the public to be really more aware of the benefits that martial arts has for people I think there should be a line of people around the block and every martial art legitimate what I mean by legitimate it doesn't matter what style like a credible instructor that really wants to be there right that knows what he's doing uh I think there should be a line of people waiting because what we do, what we keep, what we do for a living massively impacts everybody. You know, you, you know, you've seen it, I've seen it. Is when someone does more sports, they're just a better person. You know, it addresses obesity and, and violence and bullying and poor health and, uh, you know, low, poor role models. Just about any challenge you can think of, uh, more health is an answer for. And so that gives me lots of passion and, and excitement about the future and where we're going. Why don't you tell us a little bit about if somebody wants to know more about Kovar Systems or any any of the other stuff you've got going on? Sure. How would they sure. find out more? Well, they can go to kovarsystems.com, K O V A R S Y S T M S. And what we do is we offer, you know, kind of got a, a series of uh, of things for people at schools of all sizes. So, you know, some, we have a program called the Instructor's Toolbox, which uh, is, is a series of, of, of videos uh, targeted towards making a great class. And with teaching strategies and skills, and then also uh, you know, drills for kids, adults, smart, different aspects of more such curriculum, I think we're pushing almost 800 videos in there. So that's that's uh, one product we offer. And then, of course, uh, uh, we have uh, a program called uh, PROMAC, and PROMAC stands for Professional Martial Arts uh, College. And it, it's really it's our consulting program. It's where we take schools and we help them get to the next level. And how do we do that through consulting? And I have a, a, a resource library that is literally Google for how to run a martial arts school. Like a, mm-hmm. every document, every video, every every ad that we do, every instructor's training methodologies that we do. Uh, it's like, I guess, a, a franchise without a franchise. It's all the stuff that we do to make our schools successful. 
uh, that we offer to our clients. And, and, uh, and so it, it, the bottom line is, is that uh, a lot of people do just fine. However, everybody, most everybody benefits from a coach and we can feel happy and proud of the impact we've been able to have on the people that we work with. Great. Yeah. And of course, you know, that stuff will, we'll get that linked up in the show notes too. So you got any parting advice? Any any last words of wisdom for the people listening? Uh, take care of the days and the years take care of themselves. You know, it's getting really complicated as to what are you gonna where, where are you gonna be in five years. You know, it's great to have some long term goals, but the most important thing you can do is like every day get up and try to eat right, exercise and get enough rest and treat your relationships right and work hard and enjoy the process and then do the same thing the next day and all of a sudden a couple of years have gone by and you've attributed a lot and your stress level is reduced, your health is better, and your impact is, is, is more intense. Thanks for listening to episode 29 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Kyoshi Kovar. So head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, including a great video of Kyoshi Kovar speaking with and doing self-defense with his father, who was 90 when they recorded the video. It's a great example of the kind of man Kyoshi Kovar is. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. If you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcast, it would make a difference. Those reviews help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do... Go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com and you'll get a free thank you pack, including some great stuff. Shirts, stickers, water bottles. We're not going to promise what's in it, but it's going to be great and we're even going to pay the shipping. Please don't forget to tell your friends about the show. Word of mouth is the way that this show is growing and your help is really appreciated there. Don't forget to check out the great stuff we have here at Whistlekick. Gear, shirts, pants, and more, all made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.